minutes. Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. Oh, boy. Hello there. Welcome. Welcome. It is December 3rd. And it's like uh, 90 degrees outside, but then it's the new normal. It's a Monday. <laughs> And uh, and it's just you and me, guys. Um, I know I took a I took a long weekend, so I haven't yapped at you since Thursday. Um, spent some time in New York City, and um, that is always a trip. <laughs> and enjoyed myself immensely, but always good to get back here to the much more. I don't know, negotiable in many ways, um, hometown of Pittsburgh. Uh, all righty. So I don't have, uh, I have no sense of what you may want to discuss today. I, um, I know that I do not want to discuss the fiscal cliff. Uh, the reason being... It's a dull subject. <laughs> it's just no fun to talk about. It's, I guess, important. There's so much, you know, it's, it's, it's why I don't like politics. Watching what's happening now is the kind of thing that I, for my own sanity, avert my gaze. I can't. Uh, and cover my ears because I simply can't listen to... Especially, of course, the Republicans, who continue to act as if nothing has changed. They've just gone, I mean, they've, they've actually gone, they've gone right back to their intransigent mode, um, acting as if they somehow uh, have the people behind them, the people, I think, rather resoundingly uh, let them know that they did not have the people behind them. They're, they're amazing. I can't watch. I can't listen. Uh, I, I can't, it's, it's dispiriting, to say the least. It's a lot of things, but that's, that's one of the things it is. I just can't, you know, wake me up when it's over. 
when there is a resolution of some sort, uh, because this is uh, it's it's painful to watch. For those of you who are capable or even find it fascinating, and I know I know some of you are out there. I just uh, I marvel at at uh, your tolerance uh, for this particular uh, kind of theater. Uh, I can't I can't take it. <laughs> so I won't talk about that. Okay. Uh, the thing that I happen to see in the news uh, this week weekend. Uh, that freaked me out were some uh, actually some environmental stories and you think the fiscal cliff is daunting what's really daunting is the cliff that we are teetering on <laughs> on the edge of that is the environment of our planet that that's the biggie it makes the fiscal cliff uh, look like nothing. And uh, it sometimes, you know, you'll see a, a, a something, a piece of information about something that is occurring on this planet as a result of emissions, <laughs> emissions, carbon, pollution, whatever. And... And and you feel you feel your you know like your a sh a chill you know just an immediate reaction of uh, of doom. I hear in Russia, by the way, they're freaking out because they think the world's ending. They're doing the Mayan calendar thing, and I suppose people who think the world is ending, um, you know, you get this you know this tingle down the back of your neck. This is what happened when I read this. It's about the. Um, it's about the death of an entire species that is occurring now as we speak. And it's a living thing that has lived uh, on this earth and, and in its oceans for millions of years. And it's, um, it's being killed off by the changes in the acidic content of the oceans. And it's not the kind of thing, you know, that it's not like thinking of the poor little polar bears. Little polar bears, did I say? It's not like, you know, they're not, it's not a warm and cuddly thing. They are, uh, in fact, uh, pteropods, P-T-E-R-O-P-O-D-S, Pteropods, pteropods, and it's a kind of snail, and it has been happily sw swimming around in the uh, in the ocean for, well, much longer than any of us have been here, and it's a little tiny snail, but its shell is literally incapable of withstanding the more acidic ocean that now exists. And so its shells are being just eaten away. These, these little snails are just dissolving. They will be gone soon. So this is all a result of, who knew? I mean, did you know the oceans were more acidic? We, we know they're rising. But uh, they are also more acidic as a result of climate change. And I, if you have a, a scientific bent, it is a, a result of increasing carbonic acid levels in, in the oceans uh, because the water is absorbing carbon dioxide from the air and the source of the carbon dioxide is the burning of fossil fuels. I don't follow this myself, frankly. I get all discombobulated. The, uh, the, the 
water's pH is now dropping faster than at any, get this, the water pH is now dropping at a rate that has never been seen before. As a matter of fact, the article I read said, dropping at a rate that hasn't been seen in the past 300 million years. Now, see, that's the kind of thing I can't get my head around. But then again, what if you were one of these uh, right-wingers who think, or religious fundamentalists, who think the earth is just 6,000 years old? (laughs) Imagine them trying to get their heads around. What do you mean? How could the oceans have been here 300 million years ago? Let alone whatever their pH level was. And I don't know how science knows what the pH level would have been, uh, you know, even 200 million years ago. But I'm sure they have ways of figuring it out. So when you read something like that, like it, when, when something is happening, the, the likes of which have not been seen in 300 million years, then you know something is up, don't you? Something huge. And like the proverbial canary, we've had so many canaries in the coal mine, in the coal mine. Uh, this little pteropod, these poor little free swimming sea snails. Say goodbye. We hardly knew you. And it just says here, one creature, and that's what they're talking about is this little snail, One creature has been found to be unable to cope with the more caustic waters. So goodbye to the little snails, these particular little pteropods. They will be no more. Uh, Apparently, all of a much larger piece is in uh, the magazine uh, Nature Geoscience. And the, the thing is, is these stories now, if you, if you have your eye out for them, uh, they are coming at a fast and furious pace. And again, I suppose for the climate change deniers, uh, they would, I guess, suspect then that that means there's all these uh, corrupted scientists that are busily making things up. And uh, sticking them out there for some purpose, which I have yet to figure. This huge scientific conspiracy to try to get us to buy into the fact that global climate change is real. (sighs) At what point do you think? What will it take? I think last week I told you about these two anchors, television anchors in Bangor, Maine, who quit their jobs on the air because they simply couldn't take any more the meddling of the station manager in the content of their newscasts. And one of the things that this station manager had done, and this was years ago, he had sent an email to all his employees in in the news department and told them that he did not want to see another story about global warming on his news. Because he didn't believe it, I guess. So therefore, it didn't exist. Anyway, okay, so never mind. So here you got those little pteropods. They're going down. And this, I'm sure you are aware of, uh, that because of the warming <laughs> temperatures, the fact that it, there's men, you know, it's December and there are men and women out there in shirt sleeves uh, today. It's going to be up to what, 65, 66? Yeah. I believe so, 65? No. Jess says no. Well, I, I don't think I'm making that up. I saw that somewhere. It was warm. It is warm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. The permafrost. I mean, stop and think about that word, perma, <laughs> frost. The word doesn't work anymore because perma must have meant, you know, that frost that's always there, that has ever been there, that for 300 million years has been there, the perma frost, that permanent layer of frost. I don't know if really that's what perma, but I would think it is permafrost. It's disappearing. <laughs> So we now are going to call it the imperma, imperma frost. So way up there, every time I think of permafrost, where I immediately in my head go is Siberia. Okay, so you're up in Siberia, the permafrost is melting. And this is happening also uh, to our north in Canada and also in our own nation in Alaska. And as the permafrost melts, guys, uh, Everything changes. And here's the here's here's where things get, I don't know, ironic. As the permafrost melts, and this is beginning to happen, but man, it's going to happen big time very soon. As it melts, it frees, liberates. Huge amounts of carbon dioxide and methane that have been held, trapped in the ground under the permafrost for thousands and thousands of years. So as that permafrost melts away, whoosh, up comes the carbon dioxide and the methane, which does what? which accelerates the climate change. And consequently, more permafrost will melt and more methane will come out in this vicious circle. Here's a number for you. The amount of greenhouse gases that are poised and ready to seep out of the melting permafrost between now and 2100 could equal nearly 40% of all the emissions we human beings put out. So this will be a naturally occurring release of carbon dioxide and methane and add that onto what we continue to put out, the human beings on this planet. And by the way, a report that's just out, I didn't bring it in, but maybe you saw it, um, a report out shows that the United States is still the second biggest polluter in the, in the world. Um, we're, we're, we, we aren't putting as much crap we, we've actually reduced the amount of crap we spew, but they're thinking that's probably just about because of the recession, <laughs> that we weren't, we weren't as engaged in our usual activities, both uh, in the business sector and industry, as, as we would have expected to be. So I don't know that we're making any progress at all. I mean, the biggest polluter is China, but we're number two. And I love it when people, um, any effort to get what we're doing under control is greeted by, well, what's the point if the Chinese don't do anything? It's like, you know, you point to the, <laughs> the one person who's the, the one entity that is behaving even more egregiously than you, and, and that's your reason for not improving your own behavior. That, that never worked with the... Uh, your parents did it uh, when you were a kid. Well, how and how does it? That, that, that's the exact argument. And it's about as, it, it ha has no more standing when we're talking about nations and responsibility uh, than would a, ch a child's uh, pathetic uh, attempt to argue a point by pointing at somebody who even is worse. 
That's never a winning argument. Uh, also, the permafrost melting is, is because there are, there are some intrepid souls that live up there where the permafrost is. And as the permafrost uh, melts, it's undermining whatever infrastructure exists up in these uh, northern uh, climes so that bridges, roads, oil pipelines, uh, even homes are, are threatened uh, by it. So, I don't know. You know, how do you... I mean, the death of a, a little snail is is not the kind of thing that usually, uh, you know, scares the bejeebers out of people, but it should. You know, the canary in the coal mine, is, the little snail, is the fact that um, the permafrost ain't what it used to be. And all of these things happening, that's just two little things, and you know there's a million more, and ask the people who are still dealing with the uh, impact of uh, Sandy uh, and, and the reality that those hundred-year hurricanes and hundred-year nor'easters now will occur every, every year, every few years. This is what we have wrought and what we still aren't dealing with. Caller. Hi, Len. It's PJ from Greensboro. Hi, PJ. Hey, uh, so, so here's the problem is that, yeah, sure, nobody really, uh, the people who are climate doubters would say, big deal if a snail goes the way of the dinosaur. But the problem is, that, well, it all goes to the fact in the, that they don't believe in science, well, or they do believe in science, and they would rather not deal with the problem. What? <laughs> I, I don't understand that level of denial. Well, that, they're they're good at it, you know. And and when when your when your first priority is capital and and um, the economy, which this economy cannot continue to operate the way it operates, and us deal with climate change the way we need to deal with it. Um, but when <laughs> when that snail goes the way of the dinosaur. It is, it's the, the pyramid of life. Sure, that snail may be insignificant directly to us. You know, we don't eat it. We don't, most people don't even know it exists. But when that snail goes away, something else goes away because that snail went away. Well, I'll tell you what does. There's a number of uh, fish and birds uh, that do rely on that snail. And, you know, that, that, that pyramid is is if not already, has been turned upside down. So that pyramid is smaller at the bottom than it is at the top. And as you chip away at that small piece at the bottom, that top is getting real heavy. The climate and the world we live in is really, really top-heavy right now. And, it, and if you chip away at the bottom of that, that whole thing is going to tip over and come crashing down around us. And at that point, you know what they're going to say? Why didn't the government do something? <laughs> I would really, well, you know, I've, but, I've sent you images of my artwork, and, and I would like to make a giant bronze ball, let's say 18, 20 feet in diameter, hmm. all bronze, simply because bronze is so durable. Bronze can live through through it, it doesn't you know when it when it corrodes it corrodes the uh, surface corrodes it doesn't deteriorate easily is my point and i would like to go to congress and everybody in the government and have them vote yay or nay on climate change if they believe it if they think we're doing it and the ones that say well there's nothing we can do about it. It's natural. Anybody that doubts the fact that we're causing it and doesn't want to do anything about it, I'd like to engrave their name on that bronze ball. And this is completely spiteful and completely <laughs> just, you know, me being fed up and chain that bronze ball somewhere near the coastline to a giant concrete support so when the sea level rises and 100 years from now, people are saying, why did they let this happen? 
who let this happen, they can take a boat out and look at that giant bronze ball and look at all those names of the people who let it happen and, you know, maybe reinforce the fact that, you know, you got to do something about problems. You can't turn a blind eye to them. I mean, they just, it just aggravates the hell out of me that no one is holding them accountable and no one will even call them on it. No. It makes me nuts. NPR does it, you know, and they're supposed to be lefties. <laughs> you know, they'll talk about it. And, they'll, and, and it, it, you know, sure, they shouldn't take a, a activist stance, but there's a difference between taking an activist stance and saying, these are the facts, and you, you just choose not to recognize them. I mean, to even question them, they always try to show both sides of it and make it sound like these people are reasonable, and it just aggravates me to no end. It makes me yeah. absolutely nuts. Yeah, well, I, it, 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 this is such a, it's so huge, um, and you can see no nobody is moving quickly enough so i i you know we worry about oh we're leaving our all this debt to our children you know okay that's a bad thing too but <laughs> we might be leaving a dying a literally a dying planet to our well, children well and you know that's a well here's the here's the one consolation i get is the fact is no matter what happens the planet's not going to die we may die Future generations of human beings may disappear, may live in misery, but the planet once it gets rid of us. Yeah, once it gets rid of it, once it gets rolling. rid of us, it can it can repair. All right, you know. hey, <laughs> <laughs> gee, on Thanks. that happy note, thank you very much for your call. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Uh, Chuck uh, writes, uh, Lynn, I can't help it. I am glued to the fiscal cliff debate. Ah, Chuck, you're such a nerd. He says, I'm more fascinated by the political chess game than the legislation. See, I can't, to me, it's people behaving badly. I can't, I can't bear it. But I, I, this is why they say you shouldn't, what, watch sausage and legislation being made that it's, you know, again, avert one's gaze. But, Chuck says, and this is interesting, Chuck uh, just received uh, a missive from Congressman Tim Murphy, Republican, asking uh, his opinion about President Obama's plan about the fiscal cliff. And Chuck says, you know, this is the first time that I can recall that Tim Murphy bothered asking me <laughs> what I think about anything. So maybe there's some change in the wind. Okay, so this is interesting. So here is a Republican congressman who's not a Tea Partier asking his constituents, okay, so what do you think? He, he is asking for feedback. This is good, and Chuck, I'm sure you've given him some feedback. This is, I guess, a great time to give one's congressperson, if, especially if they're a Republican, especially if they're a Republican, feedback. Um, and I'm looking at what Tim Murphy uh, is asking for, but he, he's flat out... Uh, put down the president's plan, essentially, and he is saying, what do you think? I don't know if he's looking for cover in, uh, and hoping that the people who do bother to respond will say, well, I don't, you know, if, if I don't like it, fight the good fight, and then he'll be able to say, I've asked my constituents, and they don't like it. On the other hand, if his constituents say, will you guys just make a deal now, the president won. The president won. He's got a mandate. Let it happen. God knows uh, the popularity of uh, Congress <clears throat> is going nowhere. It's going nowhere. It's going, uh, it's going the way of the uh, little s snail I was telling you about. Incredible. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm fighting something off, and I do I sound like that? I do, don't I? 
Don't I do, don't I? <laughs> then my is <coughs> Everybody's sick. Everybody's sick. Okay. So that was my, I, I, I just, uh, you know, oh, oh, this in a related piece. Out of the Washington Post. Some group of bozos called the Heartland Institute. That's a, that's a think tank of the conservative type. A think tank where clearly not a lot of thought is going into what's important. The Heartland Institute is joining with Something called, see if this rings a bell, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Yep, that acronym would be ALEC. Remember ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council? This is that right-wing group uh, joined by corporate corporations and state legislators, uh, that essentially has been authoring legislation and then sending it to their minions in various state legislatures. They have been behind much of the egregious and often found unconstitutional uh, new laws that these Republican-controlled states are coming up with. A lot of the vote, voter suppression laws came out of ALEC. Um, the Stand Your Ground law came out of ALEC. Uh, the Castle Doctrine crap out of ALEC, so many of these things, all the right-wing kinds of uh, legislative um, uh, legislative, what's the word? Efforts. That wasn't what I was looking for, but it'll get me off the hook. Legislative efforts that are part of a much larger agenda uh, to I eviscerate uh, so many things. Government itself, actually. So anyway, you got the Heartland Institute, a so-called think tank, <laughs> joining with these horrible people, Alec, who have taken over. T uh, you know, they're doing the work that supposedly we pay these state legislators to do. We pay them very well to do. And guess what's going to happen? Well, the Heartland Institute, along with Alex's help, they're going to do what they do. They're going to write a model piece of legislation. Get ready for it, because you can bet you it will find its way into the hopper in Harrisburg, because we are one of those Republican-controlled states. And this legislature does tend to do the bidding of ALEC. Here is what their model legislation is going to be doing or aiming to do. Reversing renewable energy mandates that states have passed. Reversing, in other words, uh, they are going to make a concerted effort, and they'll be successful in many of these states, to repeal any standards that have been set by the states requiring the utilities in those states to get a portion, and often it's a tiny little portion, of their electricity from renewable energy. This is one of those little steps that were made in many, 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 many states to try to do the right thing. Now, I'm not clear how many states have these kinds of mandates, but the fact is, as any that do, get ready, because there will be this very concerted effort to get rid of them. Now, the Heartland Institute, this supposed think tank, is uh, responsible for posting a billboard. Listen to what was on this billboard. This happened in May. 
comparing anyone who believed in climate change, comparing anyone who believed in climate change to Ted Kaczynski. Yep, the Unabomber, the crazy person. Okay, so that's this think tank. Man, really smart. And they are teamed up with ALEC, which has shown its power in the past. And lo and behold, where does the Heartland Institute get its money from? To sit around thinking up wonderful things like putting a billboard up that compares rational people to Ted Kaczynski. The Heartland Institute got more than seven and a half million dollars from ExxonMobil. And they received over fourteen million dollars from uh, two brothers that you whose name you might recall. The Koch brothers. And Coke Industries, where they got their gazillions, uh, has substantial oil and energy holdings. So here you have it again. I mean, there's, this, is, this is so corrupting on so many levels. ALEC, this group, which is also funded by corporate money, and this so-called think tank funded by corporate money and the oil companies, now actively attempting to undermine the very small effort that have that that efforts that have been successful in some states to actually require utilities to get a little teeny bit of their electricity from renewable energy they're going after it And you can bet that Exxon and the Koch brothers will fund studies done by scientists and experts, uh, who, and, and they have, as they have, which feed into the climate deniers' um, insanity. And again, all this, and I think the PJ, the caller, said it, this is just all about capitalism. They can't see beyond that the money. They can't see something so much bigger, which is our survival, our fouling of our own nest. It really is breathtaking. And I like the idea of, you know, it's like Madame Defarge in uh, Tale of Two Cities knitting knitting the names. I like the idea of, you know, etching the names of these people who stood in the way, stood in the way of the efforts of some to ameliorate, to delay, to begin to repair the damage that we have done, are doing, and quite clearly will continue to do. But the deniers are, um, are worthy of real study. Real study. Because it takes some doing to deny what is right in front of your face. Really, takes some doing. I, I, blah, 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 blah. I gotta take a break! Um, excuse me, I didn't mean to scream at you. I have to take a break. We'll be back. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at pghcitypaper.com or call Lynn at 412-316-3381. Lynn Cullen Live will return in a moment. 36 countries, 150 artisan groups, a world of handmade treasures, and one place to discover them all, 10,000 villages, home decor, jewelry, gifts, all one of a kind, fashioned one at a time. 
At 10,000 villages, each item tells a story. When somebody else takes that beautiful item, I want to carry that beauty to them. They're gifts that give twice, because 10,000 villages is a fair trade retailer, providing sustainable income to artisans in developing countries. Fair trade has been the possibility to have what we have now. Enriching their lives while bringing exotic elegance into yours. Surprise your senses. Express your style. Experience the new. Step into 10,000 villages. I feel very beautiful making these products, and I want all our customers to feel beautiful wearing them. For the millions living with COPD, breathing becomes a real struggle. COPD stands for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease, but you may have heard of it as chronic bronchitis or emphysema. Over time, it makes it harder and harder to breathe until you feel like you're breathing through a straw. COPD is the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. It kills one person every four minutes, and it took my grandmother. An estimated 24 million Americans are affected, but as many as half of them don't even know it. It's a race against time to spread the word about this serious disease. If you're over 35 and have ever smoked, you could be at risk. The good news is, there are steps you can take to improve your symptoms. I'm Danica Patrick, and I drive for COPD. Take action today to breathe better tomorrow. Join the movement at driveforcopd.com, take our screening questionnaire today, and talk to your doctor. Have a question or an opinion? Call Lynn Cullen at 412-316-3381 or email lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Now, more with Lynn Cullen Live. Okie doke. Um, well, perhaps you saw this, but um, I guess it's worth pointing out that, uh, yeah, speaking of Harrisburg, uh, that uh, when they reconvene, uh, there will be two gay members of the state legislature, which is two more than have ever been openly there. I'm sure there are more than two gay members in Harrisburg. But this is the first time that there are two people uh, who are in the state legislature who are openly gay. I can't believe we're still doing this. I really can't. Okay, so here they are. There's one Democrat, one Republican. The Democrat is the first person to run as a out gay man and win election. And he's uh, Brian Sims out of Philadelphia. He'll be taking his uh, seat uh, in the House. The other, the Republican, is somebody who has been in the state legislature, but was closeted until, I guess, just the other day when he finally came out. His name is Mike Fleck out of Huntington, Huntington, and um, <clears throat> he came out in his local paper uh, offering up a, <clears throat> a yet another very personal account of how he couldn't uh, live this lie that he'd been living about how he had struggled uh, because of his Christianity with being who he knew he was. He went to a Christian counselor trying, you know, it's like so many, to rid himself of himself. And when that didn't work, he went to a secular therapist, as he said, who flat out, and these are his words, who told me point blank that I was gay and that I was too caught up in being the perfect Christian rather than actually being authentic 
and honest. Little psychobabble there if you ask me, but whatever. The guy got through to him and he realized that he had to be who he was. I don't know how he's come to terms with who he is given what his Christianity was teaching him about who he was. But he's grabbed onto that word authentic because he uses it over and over and, and he just wants to be. When I think of what religion has done to gay people, it makes me scream. Tortures them. Just flat out tortures them. Tortures them and continues to create more and more torturers. People who don't quite see gay people as whole or who see them as defective or as something that God obviously did not intend to live a full life. Yes, they'd have to admit God made them in some capacity, I guess he did, on an off day or something, and, uh, and uh, obviously he intends for them not to... Um, have any sexual uh, lives. I mean, who can possibly think that's the case? When I think, really, of the, the hate that has been sanitized, the prejudice that has been sanitized by religion, and not just Christianity, Christianity, Islam, Orthodox Judaism. It just makes my blood boil. You know, you wonder how, um, <clears throat> the Republicans wonder why the youth vote didn't come their way. Well, this is one of the, re this is one of the things, because young people don't get this thing at all. They don't. Like I said, I can't, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't believe we're still doing this. Oh, the first g openly gay this, the first openly gay that. And we're still doing, young people are like, what? And it turns them away from, it, the Republicans, it turns them away from religion, too. In as much as religion continues to stand pat with its <clears throat> promulgation of of homosexuality as somehow aberrant. Unbelievable. Um, I've got a, <coughs> excuse me, gosh. <coughs> I have a few um, other things I would like to discuss, but I just noticed that time is a waste. And didn't I just take a break? You did. I did just take a break. Well, what am I supposed to do now? I think I, I think I better get it over with, guys. I'm sorry. Anyway, at the rate I'm going today, taking a break is not a bad idea. Give us a little... Give you um, a respite from my drones. Um, I think I'll be right back. Change the subject. Stick around for more with Lynn Cullen Live after this. Winter has arrived and it's cold outside. So get to Littles for all your UGG needs. Littles has Uggs for men, women, and children to stay warm with shearling lined boots, shoes, and slippers. And don't forget to get your hats, gloves, scarves, and more. All available at Littles Shoes. Bring the entire family to view one of the largest in-store Ugg shops in the U.S. Littles Shoes, Pittsburgh's largest family shoe store, 5850 Forbes Avenue in Squirrel Hill. Get Lynn Collin live on your smartphone. Go to citypapermobile.com now for Pittsburgh City Paper's brand new mobile app. Get the latest restaurant reviews, event listings, movie times, and of course, Lynn Collin live on your smartphone. CityPaperMobile.com. 36 countries, 150 artisan groups, a world of handmade treasures, and one place to discover them all. 10,000 villages, home decor, jewelry, gifts, all one of a kind, fashioned one at a time. 
At 10,000 villages, each item tells a story. When somebody else takes that beautiful item, I want to carry that beauty to them. They're gifts that give twice, because 10,000 villages is a fair trade retailer, providing sustainable income to artisans in developing countries. Fair trade has been the possibility to have what we have now. Enriching their lives while bringing exotic elegance into yours. Surprise your senses. Express your style. Experience the new. Step into 10,000 villages. I feel very beautiful making these products, and I want all our customers to feel beautiful wearing them. You're listening to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Once again, here's Lynn Cullen. Uh, just, just got my, uh, my daily, uh, daily news nuggets and there's a, a piece on, uh, the fact that, well, I'll just read what it says here. Demoralized Republicans arrived in Boston on Wednesday for a rare moment in American politics. They came to learn from Democrats. When it was finally over, more than one Republican walked out shaking his head. We weren't even running in the same race, one downtrodden Romney aide told BuzzFeed after hearing the details of the Obama campaign operation. Quote, they were just amazing. Well, why would they tell them how they did it? <laughs> that's, I don't like that kind of information sharing. I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, the Republicans are living in the past in more ways than one. Whatever. It's all this fiscal cliff crap. Um, I will just ask about, uh, those of you who are into the fiscal cliff crap to just uh, give me a heads up if, if it looks like something is about to happen. I guess I'll, I'll tune, tune in um, at that point. Uh, closer to home and something that really has got me um, unhappy is uh, it turns out that uh, the, if you uh, park a car in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the price, believe it or not, is about to go up again. Remember those pictures, Abby, in between World War I and World War II of, of German Germans with wheelbarrows filled with money that they had to cart around because inflation had become so ridiculous you needed a wheelbarrow full to get a, you know, a cup of coffee? Well... I'm going to get a wheelbarrow to, to, to deal with the quarters. And that brings me to another point. So they put in these newfangled uh, parking meter things where there's not a meter for every, you know, telling you where a spot is. There's just these meters you have to, you have to go up. You have to, you have to put in your license plate number. And then you have to put as much money in as uh, you want. And um, it's all electronically done. Here's what I can't believe. You know what a quarter gets you right now? Down right out front in, of this building. A quarter. You know how much parking time that'll get you on Smithfield? Five minutes. Five minutes. Now, the odds are if you drove downtown, parked your car because you have something to do downtown, the odds are it's going to take a lot more than five minutes, okay? So, quickly, I know Jess isn't good at math, but do you know how many five minutes are in one hour? No. Come on! Think of a clock. Think of a clock and think of all the numbers on it. Twelve. <laughs> okay, so 12 quarters. That's starting to get a little heavy in your hand, right? 12 quarters for one hour. How many quarters for two? Jess, you can do that one. 24. 24, she says. <laughs> that is correct. Now, 24 is getting somewhere. Okay, let's go for three. What was that? So I assumed that if a quarter only gets you five minutes, that these newfangled things they just put in would, of course, take dollars. Right. No. No. Right. Because 
they take dollars these older ones do in the parking lots in Squirrel Hill that you see. You put dollars in there. No, no. We got these newfangled things, and they only, they might as well take pennies. I'm surprised they don't take pennies, and only pennies, where you would have to schlep 120 pennies to get you an out. It is ridiculous that people should have to have, and not let alone it takes you five minutes to feed 5,000 quarters in to get the time you want, so you actually are paying for the time to feed the meter, too. Oh, they take credit cards, yes. They should take dollar bills. Anyway, starting on the new year, apparently, these all the rates are going up all over town again. And they're going to be enforced until 10 p.m., now, here's the problem with that. <laughs> let's say, and the, I mean, this happened before. Let's say you want to spend some money in the city. So you drive downtown. You're going to go to dinner, maybe to the theater. There is no way that you can plug enough, put enough in to go dinner, theater. There's no way. Are you supposed to leave in the middle of the symphony to plug your meter? You can't put enough in to a lot. I don't know. It's mind-boggling. Interestingly enough, both Luke Ravenstahl, our current mayor, and Bill Peduto, our would-be mayor, have both come out and said they don't think we should raise the rates. Why? Because they're both running for mayor. They give other reasons, but that's why. It would not be a popular thing to do when you're trying to get people to, uh, to vote for you. However, this is part of where we're trying to get this pension. This is how they came up with uh, how we're going to pay for the pension fund in Pittsburgh that's way out of whack. And they're going to just fleece anybody who dares to drive a car, which would be great if we had public transit to fall back on. But the public transit here is not the greatest. So I don't know. I don't know. Prepare, all I can say, is to be further screwed. Prepare to... Um, put your back out, schlepping quarters uh, ar around town. Uh, and, of course, everybody says this is going to hurt the businesses. It will. Why would you have to deal with all that crap at, to shop in Shadyside or to shop in Squirrel Hill or to shop downtown when you can drive out to ugh, a mall or a big box store and park free. I mean, I, I don't know. Most people would make that calculation and say, I'm, well, I'm not going to do it. So I, I think uh, get ready for, uh, I think, probably a pretty uh, bruising battle over this. But me thinks that uh, no, matter, no matter what occurs, you will be, if you park in the city, you are going to be definitely spending more money for the privilege uh, very soon, I would think. Well, um, I'm sorry. I feel a little, you know how when you're, you're sort of stuffy and your head doesn't feel right? It feels like there's, I, it feels like there's cotton balls in my head. That's what it feels like. And when I feel that way, I don't think I my voice even I can't hear my voice right, and I and I can t and my energy level is not where it should be, and uh, all of that is to uh, say uh, mea culpa because I feel like I haven't even been here this hour. <laughs> I feel like uh, 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 it's just I I do I feel very odd, and I hope I'm not getting ill. But that's what traveling will do to you, right? Sitting in those 
those tubes, flying tubes, known as airplanes, uh, you know, cheek to jowl with uh, with strangers and and their germs with the same air circulating in that cabin that's been there since the plane was... Ugh, ugh, it is really a wonder. A wonder that we're not all debilitated. I, on the other hand, am quite a trooper and do fully intend to be here tomorrow, yes, I do. And I hope to have my energy level up. And um, my sister will be joining us. She's been a little AWOL lately, but uh, I'm happy to report she will be back tomorrow. Chris Potter joining me on Wednesday. Thomas Sokolowski on Thursday. And Jess, do we have any guests for Friday? Because we got some authors we're lining, some really interesting authors coming up. But I don't have either book yet, so no. (laughs) I'm so old-fashioned, I actually read the books. What a silly woman. I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, I'm going out into, um, too bad the sun's not out. I mean, I could sunbathe. I mean, it's so hot out there. You can't believe it. Um, thanks. If, in fact, you have listened to this hour, um, what's wrong with you? And um, if you've listened to this hour, thank you uh, for putting up with me because I, I feel really like I haven't quite been here. But um Anyway, and now I'm not going to be here. I'm leaving. I'll see you tomorrow. Lynn Coven Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Coven Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.